I'm here with Broadway veteran and legend. Walter Charles. Now, you're a legend. I don't know. I've been called many things, but never a legend. Well, I wanted to start out on a good note here. I'm glad. I'm glad. Who plays Harris Schultz in Arena Stage's production of Cabaret. That's right. All right. It's a great honor for me to be sitting here with you since Thank I've you. attended probably everything you've done. It's amazing that uh, you, you've been very consistent. <laughs> well, let's talk about uh, how you were offered the role of Harris Schultz and uh, where you auditioned. Well, I auditioned for Harris Schultz in uh, New York. Uh, I forgot the name of the studio offhand, um, a prominent recording studio. And uh, I was sitting there, I, I was involved with, I think I was doing a Hello Dolly with Tova Felshu. You at, were over at the Paper at, at the Mill. Paper Mill Playhouse in Milburn, New Jersey. And I was tired, the commuting and everything. And I thought, oh, you know, another musical camera. I think that's the only one of yours I missed. <laughs> <laughs> I almost got there, but I didn't get anyway, there. Anyway, I'm, I'm sitting in the in the studio and I've got the script and I'm, going over for my audition and into the hallway walks Dorothy Stanley, who was an old friend of mine. I looked at Dottie and I said, I knew immediately that she had to be up for Fräulein Schneider. And I remember saying to, Dar to Dottie, I said, boy, my attitude about this has just improved about 150%. <laughs> and so we auditioned together. And, um, you know, I ran it, went in and sang a song. I forget what I sang. And then we, we read together. And uh, we have a, a wonderful chemistry between the two of us. Uh, we did a little night music at Indiana Starlight years ago, and this was the first time we worked together since then, but uh, uh, we are very good together on stage, and so we got the part. Well, you definitely are good together. It was the one, the one moment that I felt was uh, the highlight for me and the people that I took with me was when you did the Pineapple song. Yeah, which, yeah that's... Which is my favorite. People Kander and Ebb song. Yeah. So could you, yeah. uh, as they say in the Pineapple business, do a little Pineapple tidbit oh, for well, us? Well, it's, it's hard to do out of context, right. um, but I could do, if in your emotion you began to sway, went to get some air or grabbed a chair to keep from fainting dead away, it couldn't please me more than to see you cling to the pineapple I bring. I'm speechless. <laughs> and that's hard for me. That bad, huh? <laughs> It was wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Uh, I'll tell you the chemistry between you is so wonderful on the stage. Oh, and, she's uh, wonderful. And, and uh, we, have a, we have a great time. It was wonderful rehearsing with her. And, you know, the whole company. Well, really let's talk about like the rehearsal that. process because, you know, I had worked with Molly on an article. I read a column called Theater Schmooze for DC Theater Reviews. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked her about uh, this production. I know she was so busy. So tell me a little bit about the rehearsal process because I know you were working all the way up till, to opening night. Well, that's true. And that, that's true with any 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 show particularly any musical it's a very very complicated process and um, uh, all the elements have to fit together exactly right um, but this rehearsal process was a, a wonderful one uh, molly is uh, first of all a marvelous director uh, with wonderful ideas but she's also um, very very collaborative she's a collaborative artist and she wants everybody to feel that they can make a contribution and uh, she will take ideas from actors in, uh, she will set up improvisations, for example, at the very beginning of the rehearsal process, and people will do improvisations and she'll take ideas from that. And then gradually, as you go along, day after day after day, week after week, she gets more and more detailed and more and more specific. And uh, uh, it, it was a, a, a wonderful, totally creative process from the very beginning. Well, let's go back and talk a little bit about your character, Herr Schultz. Mm. Herr Schultz is uh, a, a, an elderly widower, uh, was married once before. He is the proprietor, owner and proprietor, of a very nice fruit shop on a street called the Nollendorf Platz in Berlin. And he lives in Fräulein Schneider's rooming house. He has a room there. Which is where um, Cliff lives. He's Sally that, That's right, Cliff. Uh, Sally Cliff uh, love interest, and it ends up uh, taking a room there as well. And these are, and then Sally moves in with Cliff for a while, and and so all these people kind of know each other and they become friends. And um, it's it's that story of Er Schultz as a Jew, uh, living in this rooming house at the rise of National Socialism and the rise of the Nazis, uh, prior to Nazis actually taking power. But it is, it is the period of time just prior to that. And uh, it is his story and his love for Fräulein Schneider that uh, forms, I think, kind of an anchor to the production. I agree with you there. Um, it is really, uh, I, I said to Dottie, I said that I, I thought that these two characters 
were characters that the audience at large would really identify with, and I, th I think that's been true in this production. Um, so it's, it's, it's very rewarding to, to do the show, uh, you know, eight times a week uh, here in this wonderful, wonderful place. I've always wanted to play the arena. Always wanted to play. Tell me about the space a little bit. About well, the, the space is it's in the round. It's a little different from from other theaters in the round that I've played because they are largely square. Uh, the performance space here at the arena is on on the main stage, which is where we are. The Fishlander, I think, is it? Yeah, uh, Fishlander. Yeah, Fishlander. Right. Uh, uh, the the that space is rectangular, so you have two sides, uh, the north side and the south side, which are are longer than the east and the west sides, which makes for some challenging staging. For me, it was, you know, you rarely talk to a character directly across from them. You have to stand shoulder to shoulder for sight lines so that people can see you all over this space. So that, that was unusual and that, that took, uh, that was the aspect of it that uh, uh, took the most getting used to for well, me. Let's talk about the scene where they're singing Tomorrow Belongs to Me. Mm. And you're, it's your engagement party, oh, and you're this. standing there right in the corner, which is such an emotional moment in I this production. That. So talk a little bit about what are you thinking at that moment as a character? You mean when as Harris Schultz and as Walter Charles? How am I gonna, how am I gonna work at that moment and bring the most power I can? And you're talking about the moment where he's where the, they start singing. Right, tomorrow right. Tomorrow you're just standing in there. What do you think? I'm standing. Well, I'm I'm standing there, and of course I've been. I'm very happy. This is one of the happiest moments of my life. It is the engagement of Air Schultz to Fräulein Schneider. And um, I've been drinking schnapps all night and I'm drunk. And I, Schultz in a lot of ways is in denial about the situation as it is coming. And this was very common in the period where German Jews um, did not believe that, uh, you know, the government would, uh, uh, would destroy them, uh, and they were in a in a great deal of denial about that. They were saying, "Oh, this right. will change. Governments come, governments go." And you can't believe you people would actually behave like that. No, you, they you, do this to their own neighbors. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, these people considered themselves not just Jews, but they considered themselves Germans. They were German patriots, and uh, and Schultz feels this way. So he, I'm very happy at that moment, and I think that you know, tomorrow belongs to me is my song as well. I'm not I'm not identifying it mm -hmm. as a as a as a as a Nazi anthem, I am thinking that this is wonderful, and isn't this evening wonderful? And I start to dance the horror. It's a very and ironic I'm, moment. It's very ironic, and I think very tragic, because he does not see right. what happens, and He's, doesn't see it in the next scene where right. she comes in. Uh, you know, we have that scene. Right. I don't want to give too right. much away. I didn't want to give but uh, 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 so that moment for me is. Um, and that that bravo I shout at the end. Right. That was our choreographer's idea, David Bellman, just a Newman, David Newman. And it was just a, a great idea, and I I love playing that scene. Uh, uh, but that is what I'm thinking. Now. I'm just happy. I think everything's going to be wonderful. Right. You're blinded by love, as we say. Blinded by love and blinded by a kind of patriotism. Well, how much of Walter Charles is in this character? Well, I think you know try to bring parts of myself to every character and, and uh, to the extent that uh, uh, my father was Jewish so uh, you know part of my family is it was Jewish um, they came to the United States long before uh, World War II and as a matter of fact my father was born in New York City in 1901 so it was even prior to the first World War but certainly uh, those uh, the period of time uh, that we deal with here in this uh, play the Weimar Republic of Germany just prior to Hitler coming to power um, has always interested me and fascinated me. So, um, uh, and of course, you know, uh, we have all in our lives uh, fallen in love and some of us have suffered losses. And, and so I try to bring all of those things to the character. I also think he has a kind of old world courtliness, uh, which is very important. Their whole relationship is so proper and, and, and so decent and he's so heartfelt. He's such a mensch. I think the best way to describe him, he's a mensch. He is, he is. And, and a romantic. Even and a romantic and romantic to the, to the point where he's blind to events happening around him. And that is, of course, his tragedy. Right. And so, uh, um, you know, to the point that we all get to a certain point in our lives and experience certain things, uh, there's as much of me in this as I can bring to it. You know? well, let's talk about your very long and distinguished career. Very long. <laughs> <laughs> and thank God he's still performing. And if you haven't come to Cabaret, you must hear this amazing voice this man has in stage oh, presence. Thank you, thank you. 
Like, do you remember your first performance when you took over that role of Vince Fontaine in Greece? I do. I do. It was my Broadway debut. And I had already been on the, uh, the road with the national company with this extraordinary group of people. Uh, all of us began at, at the, the early point in our careers. Uh, Mary Lou Henner, Jeff Conaway, Judy Kay, John Travolta. Uh, Barry Bostwick Bastard. came in, and uh, I mean, uh, you know, Ray Demet, Jerry Zachs uh, was playing Kanicki, now a prominent director. How many twenties does that man? Oh Four man! Or five. Yeah. So I mean, we were all in this thing together, and we toured the United States for. I was with it for about ten months, and uh, then uh, Jim Weston left the Broadway company. They asked me to replace him, mm -hmm. and so I made my debut on Christmas Eve, nineteen seventy-three. That's a long time a ago. A long time and ago, you're, and you're still time. performing. And still, and, uh, yeah. yeah. I've been very lucky, but very fortunate. Uh, let's talk about some of the great successes you had on Broadway. And there were some that weren't so great. Right? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. the business. That's, That's the, the way business. it goes. Okay, okay. Let's we talk should about appreciate La the good things even more. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about La Caja <laughs> Fault because you actually played George and Elben. And talk about that a little bit. Well, I, I started out as the understudy um, in La Caja Fall. Uh, I came to La Caja directly from Cats. Um, and I was hired as the understudy and uh, uh, to George Hearn and Jean Barry. When we got to Boston, uh, Arthur Lawrence, our director, took me aside and asked me which role, that they, they had to hire another cover. They couldn't have one actor covering both stars, obviously, so they had to hire another cover. But they were going to give me the opportunity to decide which starring role I wanted to cover. And I said, Jean Barry. And Arthur looked at me and he said, why? Why Gene Barry? And I said, well, I said, I understood it, George Hearn and Sweeney Todd. I went on for him, but he's almost never out. He's and never I, out. He's never out. The guy never misses a show. He's, <laughs> he's got vocal cords of, of, of forged steel. He's ne he doesn't miss. Doesn't get sick. Then. So I said, Gene Barry is an unknown quantity. He's a man who's been in Hollywood for much of his uh, career. He's not used to doing eight a week. Right. Maybe I'll get a chance to go on for Gene more often. So we're walking up and down the stage <laughs> of the Colonial Theater discussing which role I'm... And I can tell that Arthur Lawrence does not want me to understudy Gene. He wants me to understudy George. And so I asked Arthur, I said, look, be honest with me. I said, does my decision, will that have any bearing as to whether or not I get to play that role, the role I understudy in a future production? And he looked at me and he said, yes. And I said, okay, then I'll understudy George Hearn because I knew I was too young to play George, really. And so uh, uh, I understudied George Hearn and we opened in New York. We're, we're going along fine and for about three or four hit. months. Big we're hit. a huge hit, big huge hit. hit. Right. And uh, uh, George Hearn, for the first time since I've known him, loses his voice on a Friday night. Lucky you. Lucky me, I go on Saturday and uh, they liked it and they were casting the LA company and they said, come back and see Walter Charles. George Hearn takes vacation, I go on. <laughs> they set up an audition for Alan Carr and our producer. And so I got the role of Alban for California. And how long did you play the role there? I played it uh, for the summer of uh, 84 mm -hmm. in San Francisco at the Golden Gate. And then we played the Pantages Theater in Hollywood for nine months. And then George Hearn, uh, after two years, was leaving the Broadway company. They asked me to replace George right. at the Palace. And so I was over the title at the Palace Theater, like there vaudeville, you, you know, yeah. for a year and a half. Well, uh, here I was, I saw you there, uh -huh. and I'm sitting in the front row. I don't know how I got that ticket. <laughs> I still, to this day, don't know how I pulled that one off. A cancellation, most likely. No, I think I begged. <laughs> it, was, it was horrible. You know, I'm sitting there, and here you are, you know, at the end uh, of the first act, you're doing I Am mm. What I Am, which mm. is, you know, one of the most emotional moments in musical theater history. You whip the wig out, and this Italian family is freaking out, and he says to his wife, I thought this was going to be Can Can. <laughs> <laughs> and they all left. And they I, left? And I moved right to the center of the front row. It was great. They left? They all left. They couldn't handle it. Wow. It was, so, wow. It was unbelievable. The whole row cleared out. Of the, and it was like a wedding gift to the daughter or something, and they're all freaking out. It was a, wow. great, it was a great moment. I must, <laughs> it's the best seat I've ever had, I think, for a show. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the Sondheim Festival. I got to bring it back to DC here since we're DC Theater Reviews dot com. And here you were, you played Larry and Company, right? And of course, that very frightening Judge Turpin mm -hmm. in Sweeney mm -hmm. Todd mm -hmm. with Brian Stokes Mitchell. I, I should mention that yeah. uh, the the company uh, yeah. I got to play Larry and Company because the actor who opened in that role, a fine actor and a dear it? friend of mine for many years, Jerry Lanning, uh, suffered a knee injury. And they were, Jerry went on through the opening 
and the injury was a he tore cartilage in his knee and if you don't you know it can get worse mm -hmm. and it was just becoming to the point where he just couldn't walk and so Jerry had to leave the company and um, they knew that I guess they looked on my resume saw that I had played it at the Huntington Theater a couple of years before and they asked me if I would step in uh, so I went into that but step in lightly. That's oh right. yeah, step in light. And uh, uh, I went in on I think seventy-two hours notice. I, you know, they they redid some of the choreography for me and, and stuff. So that was how I got to play Larry. But it was it was Jerry Lanning who opened it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I'm going to be interviewing Brad Oscar tomorrow. And Ron Holgate broke his leg in Chicago, and that's how Brad stepped into I shouldn't say stepped in, but no. <laughs> into the into the role. Uh, Sometimes I, actors really do break a leg. You know? I know. Yeah, I'm always afraid <laughs> to say to my actor friends to break a leg. Well, tell me about that Sweeney Todd production because what a cast that was. Oh, that was great. And and I hadn't even really listened to the score uh, for 20 years since I did the Broadway Company. I, I don't, you know, normally just listen to Broadway scores, uh, cast albums. But uh, I remember sitting there in 20 years later uh, here in Washington, and we sang through the score the first day of rehearsal. And I thought, boy, this is the this is the, the greatest score ever written. It, it it just absolutely hit me. And of course, we knew originally when we did the show in 1979 on Broadway that we knew that we were in something very very special. But then when you step back and see it from a perspective of 20 years later, it is just a, a work of absolute genius. Mm -hmm. And that production was thrilling. I was so disappointed it didn't go to Broadway. I think it would have been a big hit. Then. Well, it's it's so hard uh, to to make those. You know, none of those product. I the only one I actually saw was uh, Sunday in the Park, and I thought that was stunning. Raul Esparza is a uh, real, real is rising a, star. He is a brilliant, brilliant and talent. He will be coming in company, which is moving from Cincinnati That's to right. Broadway, That's which right. is John Doyle's a production where they all play instruments. That's uh, right. I love this new Sweeney Todd. Did That's you see right. the Sweeney Todd? I did not. I did not it get a chance phenomenal. to see it. Yeah. Phenomenal. I yeah. saw it uh, the weekend that closed again. I saw uh -huh. it twice. It uh -huh. was just incredible. Yeah. And you're right. The score is something that... The score was something else, and Christine and Stokes were... Uh, just fabulous together. Well, I can tell you, when you were singing Pretty Women, it was uh, one of the most wonderful moments, just listening to these two great voices oh, right yeah. there. Singing that was, with him, was a joy. And, and you know, uh, and both of you, I must say, are two of the nicest people ever. In isn't he great? He, we used to go to Legal Seafood here in Washington. <laughs> they would go to a museum and, <laughs> and have the popcorn shrimp or something at Legal <laughs> Seafood. He, he's a, a great guy, a great, great guy. <laughs> well, I saw you in many of your Broadway performances, and last year I took my group, the Ushers, to see The Immigrant. Mm. So what was that like, that experience? Oh, that was a, well, it was a fabulous experience, and a, a very interesting one. Uh, the Immigrant, uh, the musical version of it, uh, uh, was done very briefly at Cap 21 Theater uh, around uh, 2004, uh, 2000, 2001, something like that. And then it took us four years to that had to be a very limited engagement at Cap 21 and we wanted to give the show a real chance right. and we we did the show in Denver at the Denver Theater Center we did the show in Miami at the Coconut Grove we did readings and then finally we got the money together and a production we put it into a theater beautiful production it was Broadway at the House. Dodgers which that is now the called Dodgers. the New World yeah, that, right it, well <laughs> it was called Dodger Stages right. and we went in there and essentially with the exception of maybe a line or two. It was exactly the same and show. It was Mark Herlick who wrote it, right? Mark Herlick wrote right. it. Right, who was also on Light in the Piazza. Played that's right, that's right. He's a wonderful Donald. actor, he's a he wonderful actor. He was great. Man. But the reviews were not good. It was virtually the same show that got lovely reviews in the New York Times right. in 2000, and it was really kind of an indication of how the country had changed uh, in four years. Um, after 9-11 and, and uh, with the war going on, and uh, uh, the, the whole atmosphere um, in the public uh, was was very very different and uh, what had been a lovely show before suddenly people were just uh, were not ready to accept it again which so that was that was disappointing to yeah, was but that, that it was disappointing but by the same token I don't think any of us uh, the four actors affiliated with that actually five uh, with right. Evan Pappas right. uh, who did it originally I, I don't think that any of us uh, Jack Antaramian Cass Morgan or Adam Heller or right. myself uh, uh, were were disappointed in the fact that we were disappointed it didn't run but we weren't sorry that we devoted that much time to it because it really is a lovely piece well, we and love, I, I still believe it. that there yeah. will be a production of that in the future that mm -hmm. will be great 
a wonderful success and people will be turning around saying, how could this have possibly failed? I, I think the show is that good and that important. Well, we loved it. And I'm we, glad. We all talked about it. Memory, I don't know, you said, I just showed you some pictures where you all, you, yeah. met, you met with us. You've always been very nice about meeting uh, your fans after the show. So I thank you for that. Oh, listen, that's it. And uh, we sat and we talked about it at dessert after and we just all loved it. And we were all shocked when it closed so quickly. Yeah, that's, we, that's the business, right? It's that's what time. happens. And, uh, you know, to the extent that theater is a reflection of what's happening in society. And then as uh, society and the times change, uh, something which is acceptable, uh, one period of time will not be acceptable in another. And then, you know, it will come back and be uh, acceptable in the future, I hope, because it is a, a wonderful story and it's the story of this country. It really right. is. And, and I think it will achieve success. Uh, tell us some of the aspiring singers out there, some of the tricks of the trade, how to keep their voices going. Well, boy, I don't know how they keep their voices going, given the, the, the kind of material that they're singing these days. Um, you know, these, these screaming... Screeching, uh, screeching, screaming. American idolized tunes. Yeah, well, I think that's had a lot of influence on 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 singers and what kids think. You know, I was classically trained. and I, I don't think a, a, a singer has to be classically trained, but they, there are certain elements of technique that, that you really should have. If you're gonna do eight performances a week of anything. Uh, I remember uh, the opera singer Martina Arroyo coming to my dressing room when I was doing La Casa Fall at the Palace when I was playing Alban. And uh, she had studied with my voice teacher in New York. And uh, she said, she came into the room and I, oh, Madame Arroyo, I'm honored that you're here. And she said, eight a week? Eight a week? She said, uh, I don't ever want to hear an opera singer complain about anything <laughs> again. It's true, it's true. But the opera singers, of course, have they use their voices in a different way. But I, I can't emphasize enough um, the importance, whether you have a, 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 you know, a legitimate, classically trained voice or not, the techniques remain the same. Well, you know, and those are the yeah. things you know, to always support the voice and to always breathe properly and to, and to take care of yourself um, that's that's the way you can get through, uh, you know, an eight performance week, and especially these very very demanding scores that they're asking people to to do now is uh, you have to be trained. You have to be trained. Well, how much does the new miking, where they're putting mics in their hair and their bodies and everywhere today? Well, that this is that? something. Miking does not change the technique, and because you're miked, uh, you you can. Do things you don't you don't have to people think they don't have to project when they have a microphone on but that's not true I mean I wear microphones all the time and that they know to turn the gain down on me because they they don't have to you know boost me as much as they might have to boost someone else but the technique of singing does not change because you have a microphone okay. let's talk about a show that's uh, folklore and th uh, musical theater history and oh. that's 1600 <laughs> Folklore. He's about to plots here that I'm asking him this. 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, which opened at the Mark Hellinger Theater, which is now a church, you know. Oh, and you know why it's a church. Have to tell me. Because Legs Diamond was there, and I was there the night before it opened, I must tell you. We'll talk about that some other time. <laughs> me and uh, John Simon, the critic, we were it after intermission, I must tell you. Mm. And uh, this show, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, was uh, composed by Leonard Bernstein. That's right. And the book and lyrics were by Ellen J. Lerner. That's right. Two theater greats mm -hmm. what happened there well they tried to do too much and um, uh, the we went into rehearsal without a completed book uh, the first day of the first of all we rehearsed the music about a week or two in advance of rehearsals beginning with the entire company just to get a jump on the musical score uh, then we went into rehearsal and we sat around uh, I'll never forget this, the whole, the whole cast, and we had a very large ensemble. We had an African-American ensemble, we had a white ensemble, we had, you know, uh, uh, actors, uh, a large number of principals, and a very large chorus. And we sat around in a rehearsal studio, and we did a read-through of the play. Well, Ken Howard was playing all the presidents, and, and Pat Patricia Routledge of England was, from England was playing all of the first ladies. And so they had scripts, but there weren't scripts for everybody <laughs> and they so if if you had a, a line here i was in the chorus and if you, if you had a line here or two lines there you waited until someone passed a script over to you oh yeah here's one it's coming over to you so get it from region i mean what was the budget like ten dollars no <laughs> no the budget it was it was to that point in time i think one of the most heavily capitalized shows in broadway history it was a, and today it sounds silly with the millions that are spent but the show was capitalized i believe at nine hundred thousand dollars and the Coca-Cola company 
uh, was the major uh, backer. And uh, uh, I remember I, thinking that we were really in trouble when either in Philadelphia or here in Washington, I can't remember which city it was, but there was a Coke machine in the stage manager's office and it was removed one day. <laughs> and we thought, uh-oh, uh-oh. Maybe that explains why it fizzled. But it just, we just didn't have, they tried to do too much. You can't really encompass the entire history of the United States well, it was supposed to be a play within a play, right? With the show's well, actors stepping out of character, this is what I read here from history here, yeah. to comment on the plot and debate race relations from a modern standpoint right but then well, it was that was part of it and you're yeah. also dealing with with the the great historical uh, issues of the day everything from the Civil War to you know uh, everything else that was happening in the country yeah. and uh, you're dealing with the people the president and the first lady living yeah. upstairs and the servants yeah. uh, the african-american servants of the White House staff uh, living downstairs so you had this kind of upstairs downstairs concept yeah. And you're trying to follow these these two stories, and it was just it was, it was too much to ask of anybody. You know, I mean, right. it was, the thing was almost as long as Parsifal. You know, when we opened, <laughs> and uh, um, you know, it just it just it it didn't work, and it's a shame because uh, you know these two guys were Lerner and Bernstein were greats. Greats. Great. I mean, the the greats, and that ended up being Bernstein's last foray what into a the musical way to theater. Yeah, yeah, career, yeah that, that that was a great loss. That was yeah. a great loss for the musical. Well, theater. that one great, great song came out of it, "Take Care of This House," oh, which I love, and so it's beautiful. been recorded hundreds of times, probably thousands. Yeah, of times. some of the music is still uh, Mr. Bernstein used in, in a, a piece called the White House Cantata, um, and much I think the President Jefferson Sunday luncheon party marches right. in that and. And some of the other uh, music and Take Care of This House uh, is also uh, in that cantata where he used uh, music from 1600. So at least we have some of the score. Well, let's talk about two Andrew Lloyd Webber shows you were in, uh, Aspects of Love and this year, Woman in White. Uh, both had short runs, unfortunately. And can you talk about uh, why you think they didn't run very long? Well, um, Aspects of Love Maybe it was a little before its time. Maybe I don't know. I mean, was it too English? You think, uh, for well, Americans? yeah, it probably was a bit, if not English, then I'd, let's say European okay. in its feel. Um, and again, the story—you you have to care about characters, and uh, the characters in Aspects of Love, I, I thought, were rather unsympathetic. And, and uh, the, but the show ran for a year. So that was yeah, a, it was exactly a year. A year. And uh, that was a, a long time for a show that uh, you know, got the kind of day. Well, to. people came. Part of the problem with it was that because it was a new Andrew Lloyd Webber show, I think it was the first show since Phantom. Right. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So, of course, everybody was terribly excited. We had a huge advance. We had a multi-million dollar advance. Then the reviews came out. And all these people were stuck with these tickets to a show that, well, I've rarely been in a show that got that kind. They, they were just... We were eviscerated by the press. They I hated remember. it. And, and so we had these audiences of very angry people <laughs> who had purchased these tickets well, coming from all <laughs> over the <laughs> eastern United States <laughs> to see this. Right. And they were really angry, and they would sit there and scowl. I remember at the end, oh. there was no no applause. The night I went, it was, I was applauding, and I'm looking around, and everybody's like, they were you looking know, at me with hatred. To 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 uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber's credit, uh, you know, he kept putting money into it. He kept trying, to, hoping that it would find its niche, and it just never did. Yeah. Woman in White, I thought was a wonderful show, and um, I was very disappointed that that did not succeed. That that broke ground in a lot of areas. I think. Talk about the projections, because well, visually the, yeah, it was the, something new. The projections were uh, computer generated by our set designer. And they were brilliant in so many ways. I, I was told that uh, uh, m movie directors were coming up to the set designer in England asking where they had shot these locations because they were shooting a film and they wanted this beautiful uh, location shot. Where were they? And of course, they, they were not location shots. They were all Computer. from the imagination of our set designer. They, they were really quite stunning. And... Um, I thought it was a, a, a lovely story, an interesting story. The music I thought was beautiful. I thought it was his best score in I years. I agree with you, years. Joel. I agree with you. I think it's his best score, maybe since Phantom, which has lovely well, I melodies. Agree. I agree with you. And, and I just think it's maybe his best score. And again, um, New York is a tough place. It's a to tough succeed, town. Isn't it? it's, it's a, a tough, tough town. And you uh, never know what's going to make it. It there. didn't work. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then you had Maria Friedman got ill. The, Maria was ill. Him. 
Uh, it wasn't just Maria. Um, it was Michael Ball became oh, that's ill. Right. That's right. He was uh, gone. He, he early. was gone, and and at one point just could not come back. Okay. So uh, you know we were we were up against it there, and again the show did not. Well, succeed. the last thing I want to talk about the last row is Scrooge and the Christmas Carol, which I want to do something lighter here that did very well, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> talk about that. I mean to get you so down here, Walter. Oh, I'm not <laughs> down. You know. Hey, you've been I'm working. St I'm still here. Still I'm there. still here. Yeah. Uh, Scrooge and a Christmas Carol. Um, I, you know, I owe that to the late Mike Ockrent, and um, the, it was I know Susan Stroman, Susan husband Stroman's husband. That's right. Uh, I'd worked with Stro before. I'd worked with Mike before, but this was, you know, to do a starring role in a in a production of this size uh, was they wanted. I know people wanted stars and and uh, real box office, which which I'm not. Uh, but they gave me the part, and uh, so I, I owe that to. to and you're Mike on the CD, which is great. Uh, I did the CD, did the did the cover shot flying back from Seattle, Washington, to <laughs> using my understudy's beard because I had that to pay mine off for. for anyway, uh, it was a, a thrilling uh, thing to work with Tony Walton and and Mike Ockrent and Stroman on that production and the original cast. We had about eighty people in that company. I remember that. And the, the set and the costumes and the orchestrations. It was almost like Cinerama Alan in there. You had to yeah, be there. Yeah. It was like Cinerama in the old days. It, it was, was the whole it was, walls. The whole walls the of the theater <laughs> were the set and uh, 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 Alan Menken wrote a beautiful score. And Lynn Aarons wrote those great Lynn lyrics. Lynn Aarons wrote the great From lyrics. From Ragtime. That's right. the Tony for right. That's right. Yeah, that was a, a thrilling experience, really. And it, it ran for 10 Christmas seasons after that. You did so very well. We did very Terrence well. Terrence Mann came after you, right? Terry, Terry Mann came well. after me, yeah. Well, let's, uh, I've got to wrap this up, but I could talk to you for probably 32 <laughs> more years. Oh my There's God. so much to talk about here. Well, let me just ask you one thing. Uh, how do you feel about the Broadway musical? Is it, are you optimistic about it? Uh, you think it's in decline now? And have you seen anything lately that's really good? Well, uh, my favorite... I, I don't go to the theater a lot, uh, but um, they always my, say that. Why is that? Well, you know, when you do it every day of your life, and yeah. and I'd, I'd rather go to the symphony. And may I say, mm -hmm. parenthetically, that Leonard Slatkin has done a magnificent job with the National I Symphony. Agree with you. I go to concerts every chance I get, and and please, Washington D.C., support that orchestra. That's a it's a fabulous group of young, enthusiastic musicians. Each one an artist in his own right. Um, uh, what was the question? Uh, the question was, what, are you optimistic? Are my optimistic history? about the musical? Well, um, I have to say, not from what I've seen. Although I love the Light in the Piazza. <laughs> Thank God, uh, my I think favorite show. That, I think year. Adam Gettle is is for my money, and it, it, uh, this is all, of course, subjective and a personal opinion. But I think he's the most talented young theater composer around right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, to the extent that we can have Adam Gettle's and and Lacuse's, uh, mm -hmm. writing um, for the musical theater. You know, I, I'm hopeful that things can turn around, but it has been largely corporatized in recent or years. Disney, Disneyized, Disneyized, Disney and and clear channelized, and and you know these these corporate entities uh, are putting on a lot of shows now. We seem to have lost um, a lot of the old time producers, the the Stuart Osteros, no David the, Merrick, around the anymore, David Merrick, right? and and others. We, there are some like Roger Berlin still active, mm -hmm. but. Um, it's being produced now by bottom line guys and you know with the marketing and you know trying to find a certain demographic and, and a lot of movies being adapted to music i know i know music. rather than original material and, and hopefully i hope that will change well let's uh, end this with uh, your personal invite to our listeners to come and see cabaret tell them what's so unique about this production well it's what's unique is that it is done by the arena stage which does things in a very unique way and um it's a marvelous company of, of performers, uh, beautifully directed by Molly Smith, as I said, and this, it's very uh, collaborative, and it also, I think, has resonance uh, for the times that we are living in today. And uh, we have people who come and, and, and it, 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 it angers them a little bit because we have a political point of view in the play, and there are others who come and, and are not, but I think that's good, I think it's healthy, I think it stirs debate. and. It's a beautiful, beautiful, a tragic, but beautiful story. And especially, if I may say, the love story between Fräulein <laughs> Schneider and Herr Schultz. I was counting is, it uh, down. <laughs> <laughs> one of the highlights. But it is, I think, the best production of it um, that I have seen, uh, this and the roundabout production that was done uh, yeah, recently with, 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 with Alan, Alan Cumming. Cumming. Yeah. Uh, th that production and this production are the two best productions of Cabaret that I've ever seen. And I'm very, very proud of it. And I think Washington is very proud of it. So I would urge people to come. 
uh, we have to close on the 29th of October. So get those tickets. Well, thank get you very tickets. much. It was an honor. Joel, the pleasure was mine. Thank, thank you. you.